One day while walking around the New Vegas Strip, we bump into a man wearing a black cowboy hat sitting on a bench right outside the Las Vegas Boulevard station. His name is Walter Phoebus. Next to him is presumably his wife, Ethel Phoebus, but they're sitting so far apart. I wonder why that is. We can talk with him to learn his story. Howdy, young lady. How can I help you? But make it quick. Goddamn heat's worse in this town than in the middle of a Brahmin herd at noon. You're not from around here, are you? Darn far it is, our ranch. Ethel would be happy to yap about that. I got more important things in mind, kid. Are you a bighorn rancher? Bighorn is my trade since I was a young'un. I confess, it's hard living these days, kid. The wasteland ain't the same anymore. Hey, I bet you got a lot to say about the wasteland. Oh, I know it better than my wife's corset. What about it, kid? Uh, TMI, Walter. TMI. How do wastelanders cope with the current times? Stealing our pure breed resolve, that's how. We faced the wasteland right in the old mug and told her to shove it. Listen, we own these lands, and I'll be damned if the NCR, those Legion bastards, or anyone else tries to walk all over us. I see. So Walter here is a local, and he resents the NCR's presence. Well, what are the most dangerous places in the wasteland? Hell, it's all dangerous. Know why? Because you can't trust anything that stands on two legs. If you're looking for real trouble, head straight into the mountains. Men don't walk up there, for good reasons, kid. I believe he's talking about super mutants, either the ones at Jacobstown or perhaps the ones at the top of Big Mountain. But we know from experience that at least the ones at Jacobstown are peaceful. We can then pass a seven perception check to say, well, you look more than just too hot. Is there something the matter? Sharp eyes on you, all right. We've gone through a heap of trouble to get in town. Ethel says I just need to wet my throat. A drink? Nonsense. All I need now is to settle a score. We didn't come a long ways just to stroll our best clothes around. What do you mean you gotta settle a score? There's a long list of grievances that Heck Gunderson's got to answer for, kid. I'm here to make sure that rancher stops stealing our lands. If he ain't chiseling behind your back, he just sends his men ready for a fight. Then you either sell your ranch for a penny, or you're dead. I'm tired of being trampled over, kid. And I got a good mind to stop Heck once and for all. Heck Gunderson? He speaks as if I should know that name. Who exactly is he? What else can you tell me about Heck Gunderson? What more you want? He's a slithering snake, what he is. One of the biggest landowners this side of the Colorado, and it's all stolen, I tell you. All that money buys him any NCR senators he wants. Scoundrels like Heck. There's just no way for us small folks to get by, much less prosper, kid. I see, so he's a powerful rancher and landowner. And Walter here claims that he built his fortune by stealing. Walter, can you tell me how Heck is a threat to other ranchers here in the wasteland? We're honest folk out there. Damn hard to make the living in the desert, kid. Heck's a different breed. Goddamn thief he is. Scaring us into giving away our lands is all he's done to strike it flush. Comes packing iron and none can hold a candle to his men. Bad blood. Well, what do you plan to do about him? I have no illusions that he'll ever stop his plundering. So I'm just gonna make him suffer. That's what I'm gonna do. Here in town, he's got a few of his armed men to protect him. I just gotta find out what he's up to, and then I'll know where to hit him hard. I may be able to help you. Where I come from, we appreciate good intentions. I reckon you could help me figure out what he's doing in town. Tell you what, that chiseler's blowing hot air over at that there fancy casino, the Ultra Lux. Find out what's his story here, will you? We can pass a barter check of 70 to say, the best don't come cheap, Walter. 400 caps is my fee. All right, kid. I'm taking a liking to you. It's a deal. Okay, I'll be back when I find out more about him. All right, kid. I appreciate it. I hope to see you soon. Well, Walter here told us that we could find Heck inside the Ultra Lux. But before we head that way, let's have a chat with his wife over here, Ethel. If you don't mind, I have to look after my husband. Well, you're having a look after him from way over here on this other bench, which is weird. Hey, where are you from, Ethel? Oh, a good ways west of here, in a place you've never been. Far as we're concerned, only name it ever had was Phoebus Ranch. That was before we lost some land to Heck Gunderson. 
The bank demanded payment in full the day after the Stockman's Association bailed it out. What's life like as a bighorn rancher? A good life if you don't mind hard work. The only real fuss is the constant bother with varmints. Fail to catch mole rats early in their breeding, and you'll have three or four head breaking their ankles in mole rat holes every day. Of course, the worst varmint of all is a Brahmin baron with his hands in the pockets of a Republic senator. That's a problem you can't solve with a varmint rifle, though I fear my husband's apt to try. He's got Heck Gunderson in his sights right now. What are you and he up to out here on the Strip? He's got his reasons. And when that man gets a notion stuck in his head, he's like a big or bull that's seen red. And if it means Heck Gunderson's involved, then you better step aside before the stampede tramples you over. Can you tell me more about Walter's feud with Heck Gunderson? It's not my place to say much. Walter thinks this is a man's job. I swear, I won't see the day he'll get over that Heck Gunderson. What's so important about this Heck Gunderson guy? If that's what you want to talk about, go see Walter. He'll talk your ear off. Everything he says about the evils of Heck Gunderson is true, but I've never held the notion that fighting evil with evil carries the world forward. Is there any way I can help you out? I don't suppose you have the magic powers necessary to bring my husband to his senses, do you? He swears he won't leave this godforsaken city until he's seen Heck suffer. So far as I can see, we're the only ones in pain. I don't know. If you can't talk him out of it, seems worthless for me to try. I'm not surprised. You don't see folks rushing to help each other around here. All right, I'll see what I can do. That's very kind of you. Maybe this will be the dawn of a new day. Well, his wife Ethel backs him up, saying that everything Walter says about Heck is true. But regardless, we can still try to talk Walter out of his vengeful plot. I hear you. What's on your mind? Ethel's right. Vengeance will only lead to the deaths of more innocents. Kid, look around you. There's poison and death everywhere. And people like Heck are responsible for the misery we suffer. What right do they have to continue with their mischief and killing, huh? We then have to pass a 75 speech check to say you're just giving them the excuse they need. Hell, a good thrashing is what I want to give them. But I see your point, kid. Things will never change without us good folks. All right. I'm going to get Ethel far away from this damn city and head back home. There's a worthy life waiting for us there. Thanks for your help, kid. So long. And with that, we complete the quest Feeble Will. But this is only one of the many ways we can complete this quest. And even though I think it's likely the best one, it's certainly not the most profitable one, nor is it the most interesting. So instead of convincing him to let go of his revenge, we can do as he initially asked and head inside the Ultralux in search of Heck Gunderson. We see that the Ultralux is one of the most beautiful casinos here on the Strip. It looks untouched by time. We don't don't see any damage. It's as if the bombs completely skipped this one. There is a big fountain outside. This is a prominent set piece. When we first enter the strip at the beginning of the game, it is here where we find a bunch of female NCR soldiers drunk and playing in the water. Crocker can kiss my sweet republic ass. Get out. The fountain is for wishes, ladies. Who wants to swim? Water's fine. Please remove your bra from the bottom of the fountain and gather your clothes and belongings. Ladies, please disperse. Come on, big man. Roll up in here. All right, ladies, show's over. All right, girls, show's uh -oh. over. <laughs> Wanna <laughs> dance? The law, girls. Gamora. Are you going to spank us? I so love handcuffs. Hello, Sparky. All right, enough the fountain tonight. is a restricted area. To enter the casino, we head up the lit stairs and open the door. Beg your pardon, but could I trouble you to turn over your weapons? Could I trouble you to blow it out your rear? How frightfully uncouth. I'm afraid I must insist you relinquish your weapons. Why do you need my guns? I'm afraid those are the rules. If you don't like it, you can take your business elsewhere. 
we can attack, which is not the smartest move if we want to get anything accomplished here. We could hand over our weapons, or if we have any whole dot weapons on our inventory, we can pass a 50 sneak check to keep our whole dot weapons, but hand him the rest. My deepest apologies for the slightest inconvenience. You have my assurance that everything will be returned upon your departure. But we simply can't have anyone waving their weapons around in the hotel. It's not the atmosphere we wish to cultivate. Please, enjoy your stay. And immediately we notice that these Ultralux guys, this white glove greeter, look and act far different from any of the other casino gangs we've met. This guy is wearing some sort of golden mask. Perhaps it is meant to appear festive, but it gives me an uneasy feeling. This large circular room is the primary gambling hall. We see blackjack and roulette tables, and the dealers are all called white gloves, and they all wear masks. The women wear fancy dresses, the men wear tuxedos. In the center of this room is a bar called Top Shelf. Welcome to Top Shelf. The drinks cost twice as much during happy hour, but they draw twice the attention too. Let's see what you got. The bartender at Top Shelf has a decent stash of caps to barter with, but a simple inventory, a small selection of drinks. Moving to the north, we see a few patrons lounging in chairs, and then a man holding a shotgun. You watch yourself around, Mr. Gunderson. Gunderson's hired hand. Mr. Gunderson, and then we see him. An older man in a dirty suit wearing a black cowboy hat. This is Heck Gunderson. Beg your pardon, stranger, but I'm looking for someone. You ain't seen a young man with dark brown hair and a white hat on lately, have you? No, I haven't. <sighs> ain't nobody got one darn piece of news about my boy. Not one lousy speck of information. Ain't got one Brahmin unaccounted for across a dozen ranches. But I'm here for an hour, and my own son just up and disappears on me. Or we could lie and say, yes, I saw him here at the hotel. What? Oh my god, where? Oh, uh, he's over in the bathhouse, wearing a skimpy two-piece bathing suit. What in creation is the matter with you? Ain't you ever been a parent? Ain't you ever been worried you lost someone? You got a real sick sense of humor. You got a lot of nerves sticking around here. If I didn't have better things to do, I'd thump your skull for what you said. I'm sorry, I didn't realize the situation was so serious. You're dead right it's serious. I ain't seen my son in hours. Don't know where he went. Folks around here, some of them would kill you soon as look at you. His whole life I tried to keep him at the ranch, away from places like this. Now I take him here and what happens? So you're a rancher? Yep, got a whole mess of Brahmins to my name. Bighorners, too. Used to just have the one ranch, but land was easy to grab before the soldiers moved in. Before I knew it, I was running one of the biggest ranching operations east of California. Now everywhere I go, folks I never even met shake my hand and call me Mr. Gunderson. Don't quite know what to make of that. Why is your bodyguard allowed to have a gun in here? Made me a special arrangement with the hotel. They want to do business with me, they got to play by my rules. A lot of people out there resent success. Might want to take a swipe at me. This makes them think twice. If I'd have been thinking, though, I'd have had him watching my boy instead. Then none of this would have happened. You lost your son? My boy, Ted. He was right here. I didn't leave him but a minute. I told him to stay put while I talked some things over with the white glove folks. He was never one to stay tied down to a spot, though. It's that from his mother. Got most of my staff out looking for him now. I'd be out myself, but I keep hoping he'll show up back here. Of course, if he does that, I'll whoop him till his skinny hide turns to leather for putting me through this. But that don't mean I wouldn't be grateful. What business did you have here at the hotel? That's between me and the White Glove Society. But let's just say they control the food supply around here, and I got lots of food to give. But that ain't as welcome as you might think. Did you say something about, um, a white glove? That's what they call themselves, the folk that run this place. They're the ones dressed all fancy with their bow ties and shiny dresses. Some of them got masks, too. Real hard to trust folks like that. A couple of them show their faces, and that's who I do my business with. I don't talk to none of the other ones. Yeah, I can understand. Hey, let me help you find your son. I'd be more than happy to have you. 
Heck, I'll hire anybody with a pair of legs and at least one good eye at this point. There'd be a lot of money in it for you if you can get him back to me safe. And if he ain't, you can bet I'll pay for the names of the sons of bitches responsible. Goodbye. I'll be here. With that, we begin the quest Beyond the Beef. And we've completed a step on our other quest, Feeble Will. Heading outside, we can check in with Walter to tell him why Heck is here. Howdy. Good seeing you again. You know, I talked with Heck, and he claims to be an honest rancher. Sure, kid. And I still hump like a buck in spring. That Gunderson's a liar and born of a viper, I swear. What is it with this guy in allusions to his bedroom activities? Come on. Look, Heck's looking for his disappeared son. I've agreed to help find him. Oh, be damned. You mean the young Gunderson? That's a shaved tail if I ever saw one. He's got less sense than a Brahmin at a crossroads. I'd not be one to complain if he got lost for good, kid. If it makes Hex suffer, then I'm all for it. Jeez, that's some intense vengeance this guy's got. You know, Walter, you might like to know that Hex's barely protected right now. So Ted's nowhere to be found and Hex quite unprotected while looking for him, huh? Hell, it sounds like the perfect time to get even. Heck won't know what hit him. What do you say? Well, maybe Heck would listen to your pleas if his son's life was at stake. A ransom? I doubt that snake's got enough soul to care that much for his own young'un. Besides, what's to stop him after his son's returned? No, Heck only knows greed and pain, kid. It's high time he got paid back in kind. His life or his son's. Either way, I win. Let's talk prices. I hear you. What's on your mind? He wants us to kill both Heck and his son. We can make our jobs easier by passing a difficult 90 barter check to kill only Heck and say, Heck's life and a safe future for me have a steep price, Walter. 1,000 caps is my fee. I'll pay that much and die a happy man when my time comes. So we got a deal? Or we can pass an easier 80 barter check to also make our job easier for ourselves and kill only his son, Ted. We can say, Heck's a powerful man. I'd need extra for his son's life. 500 caps. <laughs> you leave me drier than tumbleweed, kid. But I reckon anything I can do to get back at Heck is well worth the expense. Or we can do as Walter initially suggested, and agree to take care of both of them. Ethel's gonna be madder than a wet hen. But you reap what you sow, kid. And Hex earned every ounce of misery he gets. So we have a deal? If we choose this option, we get a greater reward at the end. 1,500 caps. All right, Walter. Consider it done. All right, kid. Be good. His wife Ethel doesn't have anything to say if we agree to kill Heck and his son, but now we have to find the missing boy. Heading back inside the Ultralux, we can give our weapons to the greeter, and then head to the southeast. In the back of this circular room, we find a doorway that leads to another room. Here we find the casino's cashier. We'll see a lot of this guy when we gamble here later, and then we see a doorway leading to another room to the south. This large, vaulted room appears to be some sort of lobby, and we see a blue carpet emblazoned with crowns leading to a desk on the southeastern end of the room. Here, wearing a top hat and tails, we find Mortimer. How may I be of service, madam? Hello, Mortimer. Do you have any work that needs to be done? No, not from the likes of you, I'm afraid. I don't think you'd have the stomach for it. Better look elsewhere. Oh, he's a bit of a snob. What can you tell me about your organization? My, such a popular question. I suppose it is only natural to see us and wonder what it is that makes us special. The White Glove Society has only just made itself known to the public, of course, but our pedigree was established over generations. Were we always so refined? <laughs> I'd be lying if I said yes. But I've always felt we were destined for a place atop modern society. And now, here we are. Not everyone can wear the finest clothes and eat the finest foods, obviously. That's just the reality we live in. But surely we can agree that the most tasteful, sophisticated people are the most deserving. And that's what the White Glove Society is all about. Wow. Goodbye. Indeed. Oh, this guy.
Well, after enjoying his charming conversation, we can explore. We see a doorway behind him. This leads to a back room where we see an elevator off in the distance and a door to the southeast. We could get in trouble if anyone catches us picking it, but if we pick it successfully, inside we find a small supply closet. This is where we can find a container of chlorine. This is a pivotal plot piece when we explored Gamora and did all of the quests for the Omeritas. You can learn more about this chlorine by watching those videos here. Backing out of the supply closet, we see that the elevator leads to the Ultralux penthouse. We could travel up there if we pick this hard lock, but we'll save this for later. Heading out of this back room, we could turn southwest or northeast. Moving southwest first leads to another vaulted hallway. To the right, we see a barricaded door. Door to white glove members only section. This requires a key, we can't pick it. The sign on the outside says White Glove Society. They must conduct meetings or rituals here? Turning around, we find a door to the Ultra Lux hotel rooms. This brings us to a small room where we can climb some stairs to the guest room level. To the right, we find a door that again requires a key. But many of these other rooms are unlocked, though there's nothing terribly interesting here. If we arrive at night, we'll find many of the gamblers and patrons sleeping in these rooms or walking around outside, lounging around in the chairs. In the middle of this hallway, we find a room called the Bon Vivant Suite, which requires a key. A Bon Vivant is a socialite, a person who enjoys the finer things in life and hangs around with other people who enjoy such a luxurious lifestyle. This is the player home that we win by gambling at the casino. If we win more than 11,250 caps, they give us the key. At the very end of this hallway, we find a double door to the Ultralux bathhouse. This is a unique feature of the hotels here on the Strip. This is the only indoor pool or bathhouse we find. It's actually a really pretty pool. There's this curtain sculpture on the ceiling with a bunch of lights, almost reminiscent of starlight. And we find the patrons of the hotel lounging around on the edges of the pool or swimming. Luxury like this makes you question whether the bombs even dropped. We see lockers lining the halls and benches where guests are reclining. To the south, we find a door that leads to a circular room. We see beer bottles and personal effects on some of the benches. I'm guessing this must be a sauna? And then in the back of this sauna, we find a door to the steam room. Oh, well maybe this is the sauna. Or maybe they're both a sauna? Here we find bottles of wine scattered around. Nothing like getting drunk while getting sweaty. And then a sink in the back of the room. But this is a dead end, so after we finish exploring the steam room, we can head back out to the pool. Heading around the pool to the left, we find a refreshment corner, but this appears to be out of order. So moving to the eastern end of the pool, we see a door that leads out, and then south of it, another refreshment corner. This one is not out of order. Here we find a couple of Sunset Sarsaparilla crates, a refrigerator with minor goods inside, and some bottles of Sunset Sarsaparilla and wine on a shelf. But sadly, no server to serve us. But that's it for the pool. When done, we can move to the northeast where we see a glowing red light above a double door leading to the Ultralux casino floor. This puts us out into a small room on the other side of Mortimer. Heading southwest, we see Mortimer off there to the south and the path that we took to get to the hotel rooms right next to him. So this is just the other side of this room. Turning around, we see another double door to the northwest. This leads to the Gourmand at the Ultralux. This must be the casino's restaurant. Heading inside, we find a beautiful restaurant. Granite and marble walls, lush dark green drapes, and a woman in a fancy dress serving as hostess to the north. This is Marjorie. Welcome to the Ultralux. I do hope it exceeds your every expectation. Well, thank you. I take it you work here. I do. But one can hardly call it work. I think of myself as a caretaker rather than a common laborer. I suppose it is a labor of love if it can be called labor at all. We at the White Glove Society are all responsible for maintaining the beauty and class of the Ultra Lux. And as its founder, I suppose it falls to me to decide how we go about it. Oh, and she is the founder. Well, maybe you can help me out, Marjorie. I'm looking for someone who went missing here recently. This again? I thought this was all settled. I answered every one of that investigator's questions to his satisfaction and gave all the help I could. I know our reputation hasn't always been spotless, but that's all in the past now. How some people can't get over it is beyond me. For the last time, 
The White Glove Society has never and will never consume human flesh for any reason. It's written in the charter. Wait, wait, what? Consume human flesh? Well, this went from zero to 100 pretty quickly. So the White Glove Society used to eat human flesh? Now, didn't I already tell you that we don't do that sort of thing? We do not engage in cannibalism here under any circumstances. Though we haven't always been the White Glove Society. There was another time, a dark time, when we went by a different name. But that's all changed now. We've evolved past such base impulses since settling into our new home. I've seen to it that those days are behind us. Okay... The society no longer eats human flesh, but we find two people missing. I'm sure that's just a coincidence. We could test her story at this point by lying and saying, It's okay, Marjorie. I eat people too. You can tell me the truth. You disgust me. How dare you say such a filthy thing in my establishment? I ought to have you arrested. You'll kindly mind your tongue or we shan't speak any further. Oh, okay, I guess she really doesn't eat human meat. If we choose this option, we gain White Glove Society infamy, which we want to avoid. So reloading a previous save, we can instead question her further about this first disappearance. Who was it that you talked to about the first missing person? There was an investigator who came through here last week. He'd been hired by a young man whose bride-to-be went missing during their stay here. Well, you can already guess what probably happened, can't you? It seems perfectly likely that she got cold feet and ran off. And that young groom just didn't have a clue, the poor dear. Right. That is one possible explanation. Well, I'm actually investigating someone else. A man, this time. And he just recently went missing. Like, today. A man? Well, then this... Well, this can't be. Two disappearances in my hotel... What will people say? I'm going to have a word with my staff about security on the premises. Whether these people are found or not, our guests simply must feel safe in their own rooms. Yeah, I hear ya. But it's a good thing there's an investigator here. You said he was staying in one of the rooms. Is there any way I could talk with him? Why, yes, I think so. If he hasn't checked out yet, that is. I had our maitre d' Mortimer offer him a complimentary room for as long as it took for him to be satisfied. You see, the White Glove Society remains the very picture of courtesy, even in the face of such impolite accusations. We have nothing to hide here. All right, I'll talk with Mortimer. Now, I had a chat with Heck Gunderson on the casino floor, and he said he was here to talk business with you. What's this business about? What else? Mr. Gunderson and I have been discussing his livestock. It's put us in a rather delicate position, you see, his coming here. Not that we aren't grateful for his generous offer. But our executive chef, Philippe, has transformed Brahmin steak into a delicacy. He really is a genius. Everyone wants it. But a delicacy is just that. Delicate. If everyone can get it, it ceases to be a delicacy. It becomes a perfectly ordinary staple. And if the gourmand serves staples, it would no longer draw the caliber of people it deserves. It would be a diner or a family restaurant. So as much as we'd all love for there to be enough steak for everyone, I'm afraid there are more important things to consider. Yikes. And the snobbery doesn't end with Mortimer. These guys would rather keep Brahmin from the people of New Vegas just so that the Brahmin they serve would be considered a delicacy. That's pretty disgusting, honestly. Moving into the dining room, we see that the tables are on a lower level, and we see that some of them are eating dog steak. Oh, I guess the Brahmin steak luxury isn't for everyone. Oh, here's one. Okay, so one Brahmin steak for a party of four to share, but individual portions are dog steaks, or what's this? Crispy squirrel bits. Heading up from the dining level, there's not much else here. In the back of the dining room, we see, in big neon letters, the gourmand. Super fancy. And then moving around to the eastern section of the room, we see a gourmand food supplier. You look positively famished. We simply can't have that. This fellow, as opposed to the bartenders, sells a bunch of food, but he's got far fewer caps. Behind this guy, we see a door to the Ultralux kitchen. 
but it's red and locked with an easy lock. Before we try and explore any further, let's check in with Mortimer the Maitre d'. Marjorie said that we could find out more about that investigator from him. At this point, we can continue this quest one of two ways. The good way, to uncover whatever hidden plot is going on here, or the bad way, to participate in that plot. We'll explore every way we can complete this quest, but for now, we'll start by doing as Marjorie asks and inquiring with Mortimer about the free room he gave to a private investigator. Private investigator? Ah, yes, I remember the gentleman. This was about the missing bride. Such an awful thing. I do hope he finds her whereabouts. If I might pry, have you found something that will help his investigation? Actually, I just need to speak with him. Of course, of course. We can lie and say, yes, I have some critical information for him. Good. I hope that young man gets some closure after all he's been through. Or we can say, I'm on an investigation too. I'm hoping we can help each other. You are. Nothing so grim as his investigation, I hope. Now, ordinarily, we don't give out guest information, but I think given the circumstances, he'll want to speak with you. Let's see. He hasn't checked out yet. If you head back to the hotel rooms, his will be one floor directly above you after you exit the lobby. I hope we can put this whole matter to rest at last. And with that, he gives us a key to the investigator's room. Heading southwest, we can turn south to go to the hotel rooms. We find the investigator's room up the stairs and first door to the right. This was previously inaccessible, but now we have the key. As soon as we unlock it, we find a corpse on the ground and we see signs of struggle. But then, we got attacked from behind by white gloves. This must be how the private investigator died. But who sent them here? Well, we can think of only one name. Only one man knew we were coming here. The very man who gave us the key to this room. Mortimer. On their bodies, we find a full suit of White Glove Society attire, including a mask, and we can snag this for use later. Who knows if we'll need to masquerade as a White Glove member later on. Heading back into the room and inspecting the corpse, we see that his name is Caruso. And the Wild Wasteland sound effect plays. That's because this is a reference to the TV show CSI Miami. In that show, there's a crime scene investigator named Horatio Kane, And the actor who plays Horatio Kane is a red-headed fellow named David Caruso. Without the Wild Wasteland trait, this investigator's name is Jay Barnes. He wears a fedora and a trench coat, but otherwise the two men look exactly the same. On Caruso's inventory is a matchbook. Inspecting it in our inventory, the following is scrawled across the back of the matchbook. Steam room, 4 p.m. So the investigator was meeting with someone, possibly an informant, before he was killed by Mortimer's goons. Well, we know exactly where to find the steam room. We explored it earlier, heading into the pool and then moving southeast, we can pass through the circular room to open the door to the steam room. But it's just past midnight, and so we can wait until 4 p.m. At the approved time, a man named Chauncey enters the steam room, and he sits down on a bench. Who are you? You first. You don't know? Oh, good, that's good. So they didn't send you after me. Where's the gentleman I'm supposed to meet? I'm looking for someone who went missing. So was the man I'm supposed to be meeting here. Where is he? I'm just someone who found a matchbook. Matchbook? What about the man I gave it to? Now at this point we could lie and say, uh, he couldn't make it, so uh, he sent me instead. The devil he did? He was supposed to meet me days ago. Are you in Mortimer's employ then? And we can attack by saying, I am now. Not for long. <laughs> But this doesn't get us anywhere. We don't find anything on his corpse. So if we want to uncover the secret going on here, we can instead choose either of these two options, both of which have the same response from Chauncey. I found the matchbook on a body in a hotel room. I stumbled upon it while trying to track down a different missing person. Oh my goodness me. They must know he was talking to someone on the inside. They'll be watching everyone closer now. I knew this was a mistake. What were you supposed to discuss here? 
The girl. The one who disappeared. I know what happened to her. How do you know what happened to the girl? Because I distracted her fiancé while they took her. Well, I'm not proud of it, but I had to. They could see I was having second thoughts. Some of the white gloves began meeting privately a while back. Started talking about how we'd lost our identity. I started attending because I thought it was about changing our politics. Then they started talking about returning to the old ways, and there was no way out. They'd kill me for the things I heard them say. Who exactly are you afraid of? Mortimer. If he realizes it was me the investigator was planning to meet, he'll have me killed. Mortimer. As I suspected. So is Mortimer behind the disappearances? Yes. The White Glove Society strictly forbids eating humans. But we weren't always the White Glove Society. Mortimer and some of the others have regressed to the old ways. They've taken many people over the last few months, but always from freeside or secluded places where they wouldn't be missed. It wasn't enough. Lately, they've gone for tourists here on the Strip, even in the hotel. I guess that's the hazard of a cannibal becoming a gourmet. It's hard to please a refined palate. So before they joined House here on the Strip, this White Glove Society was a cannibalistic tribe. But of course, they had to become civilized here on the Strip. But Mortimer wants to bring back the old ways. What about Ted Gunderson? He's alive, as far as I know. They're trying to keep him fresh. Mortimer has special plans for him. The White Glove Society has a banquet every night at 7. It's in our private section. Mortimer wants to reintroduce humans into our cuisine. Since eating people is a crime we punish by death, he's going to do it in secret. After everyone has eaten it, he'll tell them. With no real way to punish everyone, in Mortimer's mind anyway, their minds will be open to the idea of eating people as a delicacy. Well, yeah, but wouldn't they at least punish Mortimer for the deception? They might, but to him, the legacy of returning to the old ways is worth his own life. I don't think he expects it, though. I don't either. Nothing is more important to the society than being on the cutting edge of New Vegas cuisine. Mortimer's idea will appeal to that need. He just has to get them over the taboo. You know, Ted's father is a wealthy man. With his resources, this should be easy to stop. That may be true, but I wouldn't recommend it. He's built a reputation, and it isn't for calmness and impartiality. He's not what he looks like. They call him Hurricane Heck. The man built his empire by hiring mercenaries to drive off the competition. Lately, he's been attacking our Brahmin suppliers so he can take over their business. He's the sort to pound in a nail with a wrecking ball. If you give him the whole story on this, he'd be liable to raise the entire hotel. And God knows what he'd do to the rest of the strip. Ah, so Walter was telling the truth. Here we have third-party confirmation, a man who isn't even associated with any of the other farmers in the wasteland, who confirms that Heck Gunderson uses mercenaries to scare people off their lands and attacks other caravans to disrupt the trade in Brahmin meat. Perhaps Walter is right. Maybe he does deserve death. But does his son? Chauncey, can you tell me where they're keeping Ted? I don't know exactly. I wasn't in on it think some of them have stopped trusting me. But you can bet they're keeping them near the gourmand. Our chef, Philippe, has an obsession with fresh ingredients. It'd be back in the members-only section, so you'll have to be careful. Don't be seen, and more importantly, don't let them see Ted in the open. It's guarded both at the lobby entrance and in the access tunnels leading from the main restaurant. He has the same response to both of these options. How do I get in there? Is there anything you can do to help me? I could sponsor you as an honorary member. The White Gloves are always looking for people who can elevate their status. You'd certainly fit the bill with everything you've done around here. Otherwise, you'll have to find some way to get inside quietly. It won't be easy, and it'll be harder still to get them out. Okay, that could be useful. Once I'm in there, do you have any suggestions on how I can get Ted out? Hmm. Well, they'll all be sampling pre-war wines before the meal. Maybe it's as simple as drugging them. Although, that wouldn't stop any future kidnappings. You'd have to expose Mortimer, but he's going to confess anyway. What if... what if his revelation were a lie? What if no one had eaten human flesh but him? If you could somehow replace Philippe in the kitchen and serve a convincing substitute instead, you could walk Ted right through the middle of that room after Mortimer speaks, and then he'd have some explaining to do. Philippe has been trying to approximate the taste of human flesh for years. He must have a recipe somewhere. All right, Chauncey, sounds good. Goodbye. Let's plan on meeting again as soon as... Wait, did you hear something? Were you followed? (laughs) 
and an assassin appears to kill Chauncey. But no matter how fast we are, we can't save Chauncey's life. This is a scripted event. There's nothing we can do to save this man. But this assassin was a godsend, because on his body is a silenced 22 pistol. If we're going to be infiltrating the kitchen, this is exactly what we'll need. But I am out of time. We'll have to infiltrate the kitchen in our next episode. What are your thoughts so far about the Ultralux Casino and the heinous plot of the White Glove Society? Did Mortimer really kidnap Ted because he wants to restore the society to cannibalism? Or is there a more mundane explanation? Find out in episode two. There are many ways to end this quest. Never fear, we will explore every single outcome. I publish many new Fallout videos every single week here on my channel, so if you want to make sure you don't miss the next one, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have completely unique designs in my shirt shop. My shirts come in a variety of both men's and women's sizes and in a wide array of colors. My designs also come on other products, smartphone cases, mugs, posters, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you bright and early Saturday morning for episode two.